Hey guys, Henning and Morten from Flip Normals here. In today's video, we are showing off a free excerpt from our newly released Sculpting an Alien inside of Blender. We will be showing off how to use the voxel remeshing in this chapter. So if you're interested in learning how to sculpt in Blender, make sure to head over to the Flip Normals marketplace and pick up a copy. Now an exciting chapter where we're actually going to be start plot, we're going to start plotting in more of the details in our sculpt using the voxel remesher, making things a little more high res, I don't know, maybe doubling what we have to again just support the bare minimum minimum of details, as well as using the grab brush extensively to tweak the form and the silhouette to make it match our concept uh, even better. Cuz here at this point, you know, going back evaluating for a little bit I realized that the sculpt is it's a little too thin at this point. It's I was trying to establish a sort of a one viewport or one view from the viewport where we can match it to the reference and then looking back and forth we realized that okay maybe the neck needs more thickness and and these are the things that we can start doing still at this stage but also sort of merging it with the uh, more rough secondary details. Even if you're doing an alien like this, which is purely an imaginary thing, and we have a, we have a concept for it, a very clean concept, I would still look at reference of human anatomy. Yes. For this kind of stuff, I really prefer to use actual 3D scans. One of my favorite resources here is a 3D scan store. They sell a bunch of scans. You don't actually have to buy the, the scans. You can you can look at the at the the product images of it, and you can just very honestly see what the different models look like. In this case, I would probably find like a a really muscular guy in his early thirties, late twenties, uh, and, and just just use that as reference. Yeah, because when we look at when we look at Archon from Mass Effect, he's quite a beefy dude. I mean, his neck makes like no sense. It's it's like a frog neck. It's just like completely <laughs> swollen up, really really thick. <laughs> Uh, it makes more sense when he has a when he has a spacesuit on, but <laughs> um, for this, you know, we'll just be focusing on the face. Even if if I have a concept for for the the like for the face here and it's all refined, I would still try to find some original reference in in nature. Maybe I would look at uh, like a tiger eye for him or like a frog nose. Maybe I'll look at um, at like. Uh, like horns from a uh, like a really epic goat or something like that. If you, if you have a concept, that's all well and good. But the more you can source from real life, uh, just the, you, it's just going to be way more natural for it. Especially because if you're if you're creating something based off of a concept, right? That's someone looking at reality or looking at other concepts and distilling that down into a sort of pure shape or a pure design. But they've also looked at other references and maybe they've misinterpreted some things that make the design look less realistic or not as good as it could. So trying to sort of extract different parts like Henning says, maybe you want to look at a frog nose to see, okay, how does it actually flow? Because you not always is I mean, whatever concept you get, there might be missing things, especially especially in a production where you'd be giving 2D concepts to then make into 3D. You know, sometimes you run into the issue where the director goes, hey, get that one brush stroke, can we make that look more 3D? And you're like, well, I don't know what, how to make a brush stroke look like 3D. It's, it's a real problem sometimes. It's so annoying when, when directors, they start to get caught up into bullshit things like that, <laughs> where it's a side effect of the concept, and they're like, we have to replicate it one-to-one. -one. What are you talking about? So my favorite kind of concept is actually the ones which are super rough, where they have, like, it's almost like you have, uh, like you would be providing something already at this stage, but just with photos of different things. So it would be like a photo of a ram's horns and just like an arrow to, to, the, um, to the bottle opener here. It would be, again, the frog nose, just an arrow to it. Because this, this means that I, I understand what they're trying to do instead of just, here's a super refined shape, just recreate this one-to-one. -one. Now, one thing that's good to look at, especially when we're doing this, is the contrast between very organic shapes or very fleshy shapes and then the more bony shapes, right? That gives us some opportunity to create contrast within the face. So things around, let's say, the mouth and the nose and the eyes, very fleshy, very squishy things. The top of his brow, you know, the bottle opener part, cheekbones, and then ultimately the jaw as well. Has these very bony protrusions, so that gives us an opportunity to play with 
uh, the different kinds of brushes, brush pressure, to really make sure that we differentiate those shapes so they don't feel the same. Even if it's not textured, you still want to be able to discern kind of what is this one object here made out of. This is something I struggled with for the longest time, where everything just kind of looked the same. If it was hard bone or if it was flesh, I, I kind of, I kind of tried to make it look like something like, like it was, but I didn't intellectually think about it. This is flesh. This here is hard bone. This here is like some leather. So if you if you don't think about it, it can still look adequate. But if you really want your sculpt to look good, you have to consider what it's made out of. Again, an important aspect here is you can see now sculpting the the lids for the eyes we're looking at it from very different angles it's not just it's so important i would almost say that looking at it from the front is the least important angle of course you still need to look at it directly from the front to see if the shape of the eye is there but looking at it from three quarters and especially from below and above that helps you when you want to try and conform the lid to the spherical shape of the eyeball and this is true for a lot of different parts of the face. You know, you want to get the mouth right. Don't just look at it from the front, especially look at it from this angle where you, you're better able to evaluate the true shape of it. Below is an underrated angle. Yeah, it, re it really is. Yeah, and also don't look at it in the orthographic views as well. I find for, for this kind of work that looking at an ortho view is, is almost completely pointless. Uh, if you if you're matching up a card to reference, it might be might be helpful. But for this kind of stuff, I, I basically don't look at it in ortho view. I think like a, a use case for switching between ortho and perspective can be like to change the focal length to see like because orthographic is kind of like a super super long zoom lens, right? So you're using like a one thousand millimeter lens, so <laughs> everything just gets squeezed together. And if you're just looking through, a, like a, let's say, a perspective camera, a normal camera, things tend to get a little fishy. You have that stretched fisheye look. But what I would recommend is then going in and changing the actual angle or the, the lens that you're looking through. And we're actually going to be doing that, switching between a 50 and a 70 millimeter, just to get a little more variation on the face as well, just to see what does it actually look like. What's super important, absolutely essential, though, is that if you're going to be rendering through a regular camera, you do not, in any circumstance, sculpt exclusively in orthographic. No. Then you are completely screwed, and you're going to have to change your entire model. Like it's literally not going to look like the same kind of model if you're if you're rendering through a different camera. So try to sculpt it from the same kind of angle or the same kind of with the same kind of lens as you're going to be rendering with. And and obviously you don't want to you don't want to take this to the extreme. If you're going to be rendering with a 17 millimeter, you don't necessarily want to scope with a 17 millimeter because it can look quite crazy. You should you should stick to something something normal like maybe 50, 35 millimeter. Yeah, something that's similar to how the human eye sees reality. That 35 to 50 mil range is is a really good range. Now this is an exciting chapter because now we can actually start, because we've added more detail, we can actually start, well, we can add more details now because we have more resolution. And this is where we can take it from looking like a very soft, very kind of doughy, I would say, concept into something slightly more refined. Still, again, continuing with the grab brush because it's essential and it'll be essential throughout all the chapters, basically, up until you know, the filing, final detailing stage. And even then, you can still go in and slightly tweak some proportions. So it's not that you should like write off one brush when you get to a certain stage. You'll be like, okay, from now on, I only use this one brush, only Orco draw from now on. Mm. But no, you, you still have the opportunity to switch between brushes. Yeah, you're suddenly super exclusive <laughs> with one brush. <laughs> And you are, you are going to be seeing a lot of this, especially from this point on. The grab brush is basically going to be our best friend here because it's, it's kind of limiting actually how much sculptural detail there is in anything, right? Most of it is proportions because once you have most of the details down, you can change it into anything. You know, you, well, obviously you can't make this a giraffe or something just by the grab brush, but you can, you can drastically change what the concept looks like. It's also really interesting seeing how 
how important the subtleties are. You can turn this guy from like a sweeter alien to like a, the most insane, crazy, <laughs> bloodthirsty alien there is. Really just with, uh, with the move brush. Change the size of the eyes, the shape of them, change the facial expression, make everything a bit more angular, and you have like a super killer alien instead. Which is interesting because I think Archon in Mass Effect, you know, he's trying to rid the galaxy of unclean stuff or something. He's pretty like genocidal. Oh, I, I thought he was, I thought he was <laughs> going to say that. He's really environmental friendly. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> he just wants to <laughs> unclean air. <laughs> yeah, maybe he just wants to clean the air of life <laughs> of uh, people, <laughs> something like that. Um, you know, but it, it, like it's an interesting sort of character where you have someone who looks. It doesn't look super menacing, but still wants to, you know, kill a lot of people probably. Um, but you still have that sort of calculated, intelligent kind of psychopath look, where it's not just full blown rage, but it's everything's very very calculated. So you have that. You kind of look like a psycho, but you're like mellow as well because you <laughs> you know that you're in control. <laughs> And right now he's a little bit too heroin addict, a little too skinny. His cheekbones are way too thin. His neck isn't nearly thick enough. And that's where the grab brush is definitely our best friend. You can see here now, that, like, we're getting to a point where the design isn't going to drastically change from the final thing. We're talking about uh, a lot of refinement, of course. You know, we're, already, we're just in chapter two. But uh, in terms of the design, it's not doing 180 degree. We're not going to just cut away different parts or like completely change proportions. That's because the, the sculpting is already is already quite solid at this point. There is we're getting into like secondary secondary shapes, but we haven't rushed ahead. So everything is just kind of slowly and methodically just been built up. And that's that's what's going to happen throughout the rest of the series as well. And don't worry if you're if you're just getting started with sculpting, maybe this is your one of your first sculpts, right? You're trying to follow along. If at this point, I don't know, maybe we've been going for 40 minutes or an hour or something like that in in real in real time, right? And that's you you shouldn't sort of measure yourself that way, especially in the beginning when you're just getting started. Things take as long as they need to before you get to the point where you need to be. That's just a matter of experience and how many times you've tried to do this kind of sculpt or how much experience you have with anatomy. If you've never studied anatomy before, you can't really expect to get to the same result as quickly. So it's all about adjusting your expectations for your level. So don't worry if things take longer. Maybe you sculpt faster. That would be awesome because, you know, that's just awesome. If you can get to a decent point really fast, that's amazing. But don't get discouraged. Just take the time you need and, and try to like follow along and, and see where you can get to and like how your understanding of it is. What's so important is that you don't compare yourself to other people because then you're always going to lose. There is no way you can win that battle. You are going to compare yourself to your former self. If you do one sculpt now, uh, what you should focus on next thing is not can you beat Morton at a sculptathon. Uh, what you should focus on is can you be better than you were last time. The reason I'm saying that you can never win if you compare yourself to other people is not, not that you can get to their level. It's just that you, if, you ha if, you're, if you're specializing in human sculpting and now you see somebody and you're the best in the world, you have somebody who's better at creature sculpting. Best person in the world at creature sculpting. Well, now there's somebody who's better at human sculpting. Yeah. It's always a losing battle if you were to, if you were to compare yourself to, to other people. So if you com start comparing yourself to your former self when it comes to your art, then you can really find a lot of satisfaction. So this is, I think this is when sculpting for me starts to get more enjoyable. It's, like I said in the beginning, you know, you're, in that, you're in that headspace where you're not really sure how your sculpt is going to turn out yet. But I feel like once I get to this point, then I can start to see the potential in the sculpt. And I know that if I keep going at this pace and with this mindset, I can definitely get to something that I'll be happy with. Even though he's a little skinny now. <laughs> it, it's so hard in the beginning of the sculpt when nothing is established and you're just doing such heavy lifting. When you're at this stage now, like you could take this to the final level with, you know, that, that's where I can put on some nice music, some, I can put on some my audiobooks and podcasts and all that. I can more focus more on just refining it. But up until this point, I, I oftentimes just need complete silence 
and just evaluating the shapes analytically up to this point is genuinely really hard for me to get to i think that's where i'm just like slightly more autistic than most people i just <laughs> sit in silence all the time <laughs> and i just call unless someone like put something on i totally i just completely forget about it yeah, you can see now that you know he's really getting some neck thickness in there and it might it might look strange when you're just looking at him like this but again that's what we have to work from with the concept so we're trying to see how can we match that and you know the more you start looking now you've looked at it for a long time where he's kind of thin and a little uh, emaciated so like adding a thick neck and adding more thickness to his face you start to slowly start to be like oh okay that doesn't look like him anymore that's just because you've gotten used to how he looked before Whenever I'm looking at this, I'm like, no, Morton, don't do it. <laughs> don't add the neck thickness to it. Stop it. And that, then after like two minutes, you're like, yeah, it's it's now normal. Yeah. But this is perfectly fine. But that's actually also an interesting one. You can go through the videos and look at the beginning and the end stages of the Because I, you probably can't remember what this looked like from the beginning. You might look at this now and be like, yeah, it hasn't changed that much. But if you go to back to the beginning of this chapter, you'll see that it looked yeah, the silhouette was kind of there, but it, it's a very different sculpt at this point. 